Okay, our course in General Epistles and Revelation. We'll talk about what General Epistles means in just a minute. Today we're doing an introduction to the General Epistles. I'm going to give you kind of a, a background to what they are and why they're important and what they're all about and how they differ from other things. Uh, and then I probably will do what I did in the Old Testament uh, Wisdom class, and that is give you a brief kind of introduction to each of them. As I said in the last class, they always say that when you, if you're going to be an effective public speaker, you tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and you tell them what you told them, which is why in these courses, we have an introduction, we have the body of courses, and then we have a conclusion in, in almost all of them, all right? Next week, we will look at the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews often is not included in a list of the general epistles. I'll explain that. April 17th, the third week, we would be meeting. We are not, because that is Holy Week. And so Thursday is Monday, Thursday. We'll be having a service here at 5 o'clock, a service of communion in honor of the Last Supper. And so Holy Week, the most important time of the Christian year, we will not be meeting for any of our classes. The following week, the book of James. May 1st, books of 1st and 2nd Peter. Some people break it up. They'll put 2nd Peter with you know, with 1st John or with Jude, different things. Actually, 2nd Peter and Jude are very similar. So, but we're not going to do that. We're going to stick with 1st and 2nd Peter. May 8th, Carolyn and I have to be out of the country, and so we will not be meeting May 8th. I think it's great. We'll meet two weeks, take a week off. Meet two weeks, take a week off. Meet three weeks, and we're done. Okay? <laughs> then May 15th, the books of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Jude. May 22nd, the book of Revelation, which also, uh, it's never listed as one of the general epistles. I'll talk about why. But we're putting it together there. Um, and then May 29th, we'll do a conclusion in the final exam. I will work to have for you by May 15th, two weeks before the final, our document on what you need to know from general epistles and Revelation so that you can study that. Okay? Any questions about where we're going with this? Okay. Um, the general epistles, or New Testament, well, first the New Testament epistles, which include the letters of Paul. Um, the New Testament general epistles are those epistles not written by Paul. They include, for the sake of our conversation, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Now, um, a, an epistle is a letter, but it's a special kind of letter. It's a letter that's intended to be read publicly. That's true for Paul's epistles, and it's also true for these general epistles. Now, let me talk about that. Um, everybody agrees that the general epistles, that there are at least seven of them, um, that is James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. They are, uh, people differ on whether or not they include Hebrews in that. And the reason they differ on whether or not they include Hebrews in that is because Hebrews historically between the 4th century and the Reformation, not before that, not after that, um, Hebrews was considered to be written by Paul. Well, those of you who have been in the church history class or in, in, in other Bible, biblical theology classes, what happened during the Reformation that changed the way we understand Scripture? The sola scriptura meaning the Reformation, a major emphasis of the Reformation was the emphasis on Scripture alone as the source of our authority, which means the study of Scripture from a, a more objective point of view really exploded with the Reformation. Prior to the Reformation, all theology, all biblical theology, really was dogmatic theology, which means it was intended purely to defend and explain Roman Catholic doctrine. The Reformation comes along, that's not the priority anymore. The priority is what does it really say and what does it really mean? Well, when they got into that and they started examining the book of Hebrews, they said, this is nothing like Paul's other letters. Now, most of Paul's letters say, from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to somebody, the church in Rome, etc. Um, Hebrews does not identify who the author is. The style of Hebrews is very different. The vocabulary of Hebrews is very different. There is nothing about the book of Hebrews that would lead us to believe it was written by Paul, other than the fact that somebody in the fourth century decided, and that nobody disagreed after that, I think it was Clement of Alexandria first, that, that Paul, they think Paul wrote it. But now, we don't know who wrote it. In fact, Hebrews is unique in all the Bible in that we have no clue who wrote it. There's a lot of different opinions. Different people have had different ideas. Um, I'll talk about that when I get. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So, Hebrews is often not included. 
Sometimes it is. You pick up any, any um, study Bible, you pick up any commentary, it may or may not include Hebrew in the general epistles. Depending upon whether they believe it was written by Paul, some people still do, but not many. The Re book of Revelation is not included in the general epistles, but we're including it in that because in some, there are some parts of it that actually are epistolary, as it, to use the, the uh, adjective there, in its style, meaning it is very much like a letter written. It starts out with a letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor. So it is a letter, and it probably was intended to be read, publicly read and even circulated amongst those churches. So there's some ways in which it fits that, but it's much more apocalyptic literature and prophetic literature, more similar to Daniel and some others. But these are the these are the, the letters that we're talking about. We're also going to then include, well, uh, besides these general epistles, Revelation in our class. Now they're also known as the Catholic epistles. Catholic does not mean Roman Catholic. The word Catholic, Catholicos, actually means universal. Now these are called the universal letters. They're sometimes called the non-Pauline epistles as well. That's a simple definition. There's two categories, Pauline and non-Pauline. But um, these differ from the Pauline epistles in that while Paul's letters are named for their recipients, you know, Paul's letter to the Romans was written to the church in Rome, the Philippians to Philippi, the Thessalon uh, church to Thess Thessalonians to Thessalonica, etc. Even to people, Titus and, and Timothy, um, Philemon. These letters are not named for who they're being sent to because they are not being sent to one person or one church. And, and with two exceptions, these letters are all written either to the whole church or to a large section of the church. It will say things like, you know, to the believers in uh, the diaspora, meaning those who are spread out. So there really are universal in terms of their appeal. The exceptions to that. Second John is written to the elect lady and her children. And I'll tell you, we'll talk about that in a minute, but it, we don't know if that means really a woman and her children, a Christian woman, or if it means a church. And the elect lady is a, is a metaphor for the church. The book of Third John is written to a person, Gaius. And it's, a, it's, a, it's very, one chapter, Third John, written in praise to Gaius and in condemnation of Diotrephes who is a guy who apparently is really messing up the church. So, but other than those two, all of them are written to a large audience or to the entire church. So they are universal. They are Catholic, unlike any of the letters of Paul. Make sense? So that's why they often are called Catholic. Um, all right. Um, and they were first called the Catholic epistles by Origen and then by Eusebius in the 3rd century. That's where they got that title. Does not mean Roman Catholic. I, virtually every time I, you know, we do the creeds in our church and we say we believe in one church, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, somebody will come up to me and say, why do you say you believe in the Catholic Church? Well, because Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. Okay? And that's why it doesn't, we don't use a capital C. You will stop me if you have any questions. You all know about that, right? You know, you let me know if there's anything. So this is what we're talking about. Now, the New Testament general epistles. Most of the general epistles are short books, and they were written to address specific kinds of concerns. There are a couple of them that address a number of concerns, but it concerns controversies or heresies within the church. Some of the shorter ones identify one problem. The book of Jude is the most pointed book about false teachers those who are teaching heresy within the church. Some of the themes that, that we have are encouraging continued faithfulness to Jesus. The book of Hebrews is apparently written to, it doesn't say this, but this, the content says, that it's written to Jewish converts, that is, Jewish Christians who were considering reverting back to their Catholicism. And it's encouraging them, the argument is that Jesus is better. Don't go back. And so that's encouraging continued faithfulness. Promoting love within the Christian community is a theme. Promoting hospitality to strangers. However, not welcoming heretical teachers into your home is, is the opposite of that. Encouraging godly behavior and then against false teaching, especially Gnosticism. That Gnostic, the against Gnosticism is one of the most common themes. Now, they don't use the word Gnostic. And in fact, again, I, it just amazes me how short-sighted people are. are, are 
more liberal, less traditional or conservative theologians will look at these books and say, any of these books that talk about what clearly is Gnosticism must come from the second century, later. They're not, they didn't come out when they say they did, you know, the church says they did. They were not written by who's supposed to have written them because Gnosticism wasn't really present until the second century because we have no evidence of it. We've got at least two of Paul's letters and at least four or five of the general epistles all address what obviously is Gnosticism. What do you mean we don't have any evidence of first century Gnosticism? You know, because we don't have any non-biblical references, they say we don't have, Gnosticism didn't exist. Well, we will agree that the Gnosticism that existed in the first century when these books were written, as we believe traditionally, as I believe, um, it was a nascent Gnosticism. Nascent meaning early or just born. You know, that's where we get nascimento, you know, the, the idea of a nativity scene. Um, that it is an early Gnosticism or proto-first Gnosticism. But it is Gnosticism because it's very clear that it's denying the physical uh, incarnation of Jesus because the Gnostics thought the physical things were bad, and so therefore it couldn't really be Gnostic. It couldn't. Uh, Jesus could not really have been a human being in, in the flesh because God would not become physical because physical is bad. It's very clear that it's arguing that, and that is Gnosticism. That's one of the primary tenets of Gnosticism. So, uh, a lot of con con uh, teaching about um, contrary to false teaching and Gnosticism especially. Now the general epistles tend, and it's interesting, and I didn't even attend this until I really got into it. Thursday mornings we're spending two hours talking about the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, and Thursday afternoon we're talking about the New Testament general epistles. In terms of theme and content, those two sections are very similar. Wisdom literature in the Old Testament, general epistles in the New Testament. For this reason, the general epistles, like the wisdom literature, tend to focus on the practical side of our faith. How you live out your faith. The wisdom literature, those of you who were here this morning heard me say, have to do with very practical things like how you raise your kids, how you find a good wife, how you keep from going in debt, etc., etc. Okay. In this case, this has a little bit more to do with the practice of our faith, but still very practical in the general epistles. The power of prayer, how to hold your tongue, dealing with false teachers, being patient, being persistent, overcoming fear, etc. So most of the general epistles are very practical in terms of how do you live out your faith in the real world. And then things like the danger of the tongue that James gets into. Right? The, necess the necessity of having good works. Not because they save you, but because that's obedience to God. And if you don't have any good works, it's a real serious question of whether you have a spiritual side you know, right or not. Okay? So they are very practical. The eight general epistles, and in that I am including Hebrews, which I think it's it's makes most sense to lump it in the category of general epistles, because if you don't, then it's by itself. And we've already got the book of Acts is kind of, is by itself. The book of Revelation is by itself. You add Hebrews by itself, and we end up with a whole bunch of different categories, and I don't think it's necessary. So eight would include Hebrews. They're written by five different authors, covering a wide variety of topics. And they form a unity, in other words, a group of the general epistles, not so much because they have any sort of internal cohesion, but because they are distinct from anything else in the New Testament, most especially distinct from the Pauline epistles. Not only because Paul wrote all the others, but because they are universal, they have a very different tact. Paul's work is much more theological in terms of a, a theological understanding of our faith. The general epistle is much more practical on how do you live it out. Right? Got that? Uh, traditionally, all of the general epistles were written before the destruction of the uh, Jerusalem Temple in AD 70, except for the epistles of John. And that's partly because John lived longer than any of the other writers. He lived until the late first century. We believe Paul, John probably didn't die until 98 or 99, somewhere in there. We believe that um, the epistles of John were written sometime between 85 and 90, and that... Um, his gospel was the last of the gospels. People say, why is the gospel of John so different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in terms of their viewpoint and their focus and the, their approach. So much so they're called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the same seeing gospels. John is very different. One of the reasons John is different is because John wrote his gospel so much later, he had access to the first three. And apparently, 
I don't think it's stretching too far to say John read the other three and said we don't need to say, say the same things again. Instead of saying the story of Jesus' earthly ministry like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John gives us a book that talks about the theological importance. What, not what happened, but what does it mean? And that's why John's gospel is different. Because it was written much later. The epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John were written later, and the Revelation was written later. One of the things that you will hear is that, in this, you know, uh, land here we have Elaine Pagels. Um, <laughs> you have liberal scholars who will say that there was John the Evangelist, who was one of the apostles with Jesus, who wrote the gospel. Then, or John the Apostle, some even say John the Apostle and John the Evangelist were different. Then you have John the John of Patmos, who wrote the book of Revelation. And then you have John the Elder, who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. I mean, they come up with three or four different Johns responsible for the writings in the New Testament. The traditional view, and this is maintained by people who knew John, people like Polycarp, one of the... Um, the early church fathers, one of the patristic fathers, who was actually a student of John's in, in Ephesus and knew him. Polycarp is one of the people who says that the same John the Apostle who wrote the Gospel also wrote the Revelation and also wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And yet you have people, I mentioned Elaine Pagels, Lynn is reading her book on Revelation, who says that John of Patmos was a 2nd century person. Could not have been John the Apostle and Evangelist. I don't believe that. As I've said before, I believe that when you have such strong traditions in the church, including from people who knew these people firsthand, Polycarp knew John firsthand, and Polycarp plainly writes that John wrote all five of those books. You have to have overwhelming evidence to then deny that. All right? Especially if what you're denying is what the book itself says. Like Paul saying, no, Paul did not write 2 Thessalonians when the book of 2 Thessalonians says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, am writing this. Okay. Not that I feel strongly about that. <laughs> so, we believe that all of them were written before the destruction of the temple in AD 70. The reason we say that is because the destruction of the temple by the Romans in AD 70, the temple of Jerusalem, was the watermark event in the lives of the Jewish people in the first century. To not have referred to that, especially in a book like Hebrews, which is writing to Jewish people about the, how, how, better, how much better Jesus is than the sacrificial and mosaic system, to not even mention that, the only way they could not mention that is if it hadn't happened yet. Right? But John is the exception. We believe because we know he did most of his writing later in his life, we believe those were written sometime later between 85 and 98. Okay? And then... The general epistles have been some of the most disputed of all the New Testament books. If we think people have problems with some of the Pauline epistles as not being from Paul, there have been specific uh, opposition to accepting as canon James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Jude. Um, partly because you need to understand that the canon was not solidified, was not, was not locked in until the 300s. Now, there was an understanding amongst the church as early as the, the second century, the 100s, of what books were part of the canon. But people continue to question some of them. The book of James was questioned because James himself was not an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was the brother of Jesus and the head of the Jerusalem Council. But by the time they started seriously considering James's book, they thought the content was valid, but they weren't sure because he wasn't an apostle and they couldn't trace it back to the apostolic ministry that was this or was this not part of canon. The one they probably had most trouble with is 2 Peter. And the reason why 2 Peter has had so much heartburn uh, to people trying to accept it is because by the, the um, late 2nd and 3rd centuries, there were, Peter was so popular. I mean, Peter was the first of the apostles, right? He was the one on whom the, you know, the church would, would, uh, would be built. This is the rock on whom I will build my church. He was the leader of the apostles during much of, much of his uh, life. So Peter was so popular that a number of people had written false documents and claimed they were by Peter. There is an apocalypse of Peter. There is the wisdom of Peter. There are various other books that were attributed falsely to Peter and claimed plainly were not canon. They included wacky stuff, stuff that was not consistent. Well, that caused them to seriously doubt anything that had Peter's name on it. 
And so Second Peter went through a period of time in which they were not sure that it was not one of these other things. But eventually they said, but there's nothing in this that's wacky. There's nothing in this that causes us to disbelieve it the way those other writings. And so eventually they concurred that it was written by Peter the Apostle. All right? Um, any questions about that? Thoughts? Comments? See where we're going with all of that? This may be a short class. Uh, which is fine with me <laughs> if, we, if, if we cover what we need to cover. All right, I want to begin to talk about the epistles one at a time, give you a little bit more background. And this will, again, just get us a taste of where we're going so that as we begin to open these up in future weeks, you'll have some context for it. The book of Hebrews, we believe, was written around um, A.D. 65, it presents Christ as the high priest. And the purpose, as we understand it, it doesn't say this is the purpose, but this is what we easily derive from reading the content, is to encourage Jewish Christian believers to stay true to the faith and not return to Judaism. Uh, the book of Hebrews is the, the theme. If, if you had one word that you want to pick for the book of Hebrews, that word would be better. Because Hebrews is all about how it is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is better than any alternative. Um, and again, it is very specifically written to Jewish converts. It was called the book of Hebrews, not because there's something in there called it the Hebrews, but because it clearly is oriented toward Jewish readers and to Jewish Christian readers. And so it became called the book of Hebrews. Now, we do not know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We've had various people at various times uh, over the centuries um, say that it might have been Clement of Rome who wrote it, or Luke who wrote it, perhaps Barnabas, who was suggested by Tertullian, uh, Luther thought maybe Apollos wrote it, um, William Ramsey, a uh, modern theolog theologian, believes it was Philip the Evangelist, you know, who, who was a deacon and performed miracles, um, Adolf von Harnack, Harnack was a liberal theologian, but he first came up with the idea that perhaps it was Priscilla, a Priscilla and Aquila, comrades and, and co-workers and ministers with Paul, who taught Apollo. You know, Apollo came from Alexandria, and apparently he was a great speaker, but he didn't have all of his theology right, but he meant well. So Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and taught him what you know, the truth was so he could be more effective, and he ended up being very effective in Ephesus and especially in Corinth. So. Um, there actually, there's a, a woman who in 2001, her name is Robin, oh, no, Ruth Hobbin, that, that's what it is, Ruth Hobbin, H-O-B-B-I-N. She wrote a book called uh, The Letter of Priscilla, Finding the Author of the Book of Hebrews. And I have not read the book, but apparently some critiques I've read of it say that she does a very respectable and scholarly job of using archaeological evidence as well as other testimonies from early days to advocate that the book was written by Priscilla. And that the reason we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews is because they were unwilling or felt unable because of not wanting it to be rejected to attribute it to a woman. Because a woman would not have been considered a theological authority. <coughs> now, the content of it is so clearly appropriate for Scripture that um, it's... The fact that we don't know who the author is has caused it some problem over the years, but people have always said, no, this is, this is God's word to us. In fact, the early uh, chapters, uh, the first chapter especially, of um, our Hebrews is one of the most important Christological statements that we have, a statement about Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. And so it is very powerful, and, and, but we don't know who wrote it. In fact, the famous remark from Origen back in the third century still holds true today. Origen said, who the author of the epistle is, God only knows. So we don't know who wrote it. Someday we will. Um, we believe uh, between 64 and 68 is the appropriate time. And when we say, if we don't have any attribution, specific attribution, we would, you say, well, how do they come up with dates like that? Circa, you know, about. Sometimes it has to do with the fact that, again, here's a book being written to Jewish Christians saying don't revert to Judaism, 
if the temple had already been destroyed, as it was in AD 70 by the time this was written, then that would have clearly been a major topic to talk about is you can't return to the sacrificial, sacrificial system anyway. <coughs> it's not even mentioned. So that suggests it is earlier, and yet it was a time in which there were Jewish Christians that were part of the diaspora, the spreading out, um, and there were enough of them in various places that this could be written to the brothers in the diaspora. And so that's where they come up with ranges of dates based upon the points of history that we actually do have. Okay. Um, the, the, the book of Hebrews is almost more of a sermon than it is a letter. The content of it is presented that way, and it even calls itself, uh, in, in one place, a word of exhortation, which is what you would describe as a sermon as. Um, the theme, as I said, is better. Uh, there are three parts to the book of Hebrews. Part one identifies the superiority of Christ's person. It identifies that he is greater than the prophets, he is greater than the angels, he is greater even than Moses. Okay, prophets and Moses give you the idea that he's talking to Jewish people because it would not, not have meant anything to a Gentile or you know, any Roman citizen who, you know, why, why is being better than the prophets or Moses in particular? That's a Jewish issue. So the first section is the superiority of Christ's person. The second section is the superiority of Christ's work, what he has done for us. And that deals with the priesthood of Jesus Christ. As I say, it, this, this presents Jesus as the great high priest which is a very Jewish way of thinking. It then talks about the superiority of Christ's covenant as opposed to the covenant given to Moses. And then the superiority of Christ's sanctuary and sacrifice over against the sanctuary of the temple and the sacrifice of the temple. And again, we know we believe this has to be written before AD 70 because that would be where the person would say, and by the way, the temple and the sacrificial system don't exist anymore. But they don't, so this was before that. And the third section is the superiority of the Christian walk of faith. The, an exhortation to be to full assurance in the faith, to endure in the faith, to have an exhortation to love, and then a concluding statement about sticking with it, hanging in there. Okay. Um, there's a wonderful passage, by the way, in Hebrews 11 that we will look at next week that looks at a hall of fame of, of people of faith down through the history, uh, starting starting all the way back to Abel, as in Cain and Abel, and coming up to David, Samuel, and the prophets, and everybody in between that were people of faith. Questions about Hebrews? At least this brief introduction to Hebrews. Let's talk about the book of James. Um, the book of James is about the necessity of living a practical Christian life in terms of how, how you practice your faith in how you live. Uh, everybody who's anybody is familiar with the phrase, faith without works is dead found in the book of James. The whole idea behind James is that having just a mental assent to the belief is not sufficient if there is nothing in your life that causes you to, to demonstrate God's love and presence in your life. Um, we believe that the author of the book of James was James the Just, who was the head of the Jerusalem council, the one who was running the council in, in uh, Acts 15 when they met to talk about what do we do with Gentiles who become believers in Jesus? Do they have to be circumcised, etc.? And he was the half-brother of Jesus. Same mother, but different father in terms of James. James's father would have been uh, Joseph. So, in fact, two of the general epistles were written by half-brothers of Jesus, we believe. The Gospel of James by James the Just, the leader of the Jerusalem church. The book of Jude by Jesus' half-brother, and the reason we know that is because the book of Jude identifies itself as being, Jude says, a brother of James. Well, James the Apostle, who's called James the Greater, uh, died early. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. So the James that's being referred to there is James the Just, James the Lesser, sometimes called, because he wasn't, you know, he wasn't one of the apostles, but the head of the Jerusalem Council. And Jude, I'll get to that in a minute, Jude's real name was Judas. But early on in the Greek, in the Septuagint, they changed it from Judas to Jude, which is kind of a nickname for Judas, anybody named Judas, because they didn't want anybody confusing him with the Judas that did all the bad stuff. Okay. Um, so anyway, James, there are at least five people named James in the New Testament. The 
James, who died early, died too early to have been involved in this and written it. Uh, the others are fairly insignificant. They're just identified by name. James, son of Alphaeus, you know, one of the other apostles was a James, but we don't have any record of him, so we believe this is James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the Jerusalem Council. Um, the book of James, we believe, I believe, is the earliest of the New Testament writings before even Galatians, which is the first of Paul's letters. Generally speaking, Paul wrote his letters before any of the other writings. The one exception of that is the book of James, and there's several reasons we think that. There's no mention of Gentile believers or their relationship to Jewish Christians anywhere in the book of James. There's no suggestion that anybody is a follower of Jesus except for Jews. Um, there are allusions to the teachings of Christ that are not Nowhere does he quote or allude to statements that are made in the Gospels, which means this was almost certainly written before the Gospels were written. Not inconsistent with, but just no direct reference to, and yet some of the things James talks about, it would have been very natural for him to have quoted Jesus as it was recorded in the Gospels. James was not there with Jesus, so if he quoted it, it would have to be from that, but we don't find that. Um, there's also the uh, some of the terms that James uses, like he uses the word... Instead of the word for church that we know of, he uses the Greek word for synagogue, which again refers to the fact this was before, the, this was when all of the, the Jews were still worshiping in synagogue if they were Christians, and before the formation of particular churches. So we believe this was very early. Um, that's why we have 45 AD up there. Now that compares to Galatians, which we believe was written probably 46 or 47. So the very first of the New Testament books probably. It was, um, the way it's written, it is very much like the wisdom literature. If you were in the last class, I, I was talking about wisdom literature as a genre, and we have the, the books of the Old Testament that are called the wisdom literature, Job, Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. Proverbs, sometimes the Song of Solomon, and we lump in Psalms because some of the Psalms are wisdom literature. But you also look to the New Testament, and there are New Testament examples that fit in the category of wisdom literature. That is, practical sayings for how to live your life in a very real way. Some of the sayings of Jesus, the parables, are that, and also the book of James. The book of James has actually been called the Proverbs of the New Testament because it is very much like the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. It deals with the, uh, how the faith gets tested, what real faith is, and how faith can triumph. Uh, James has also been called the Amos of the New Testament because his concern is for ethical integrity, which is what the prophet Amos was all about, ethical integrity and justice. In fact, um, in the 108 verses that are in the book of James, there are 54 different imperatives, orders. Paul is saying, this is how you live. This is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're not supposed to do. So 54 different times in the 108 verses, James gives us orders. So he is very adamant about uh, being consistent in, in our ethical lives. There are some people who believe that James and Paul are contradictory to one another, Luther being one. Luther, because Luther was living at a time when a lot of his focus had to be um, opposing the Catholic Church's emphasis on works. And because James says faith without works is dead, Luther tended to look down on the book of James. He called it a right straw epistle, an epistle made of straw. And I'm told, we're told, he, was, he put it in the back of his Bible so he didn't have to flip through it when he was looking for other stuff. Now, I don't think Luther was right. And most other scholars since then don't think he was right. James and Paul are not in conflict over this issue. James does not say you get saved by your works. What he says is, if you are saved, you will have works. And if you don't, you need to start asking some serious questions about your faith. So James and Paul are not contradictory to one another, although he's often accused of that. Um, and just James was dealing with libertines, people who believed that they could say they were Christians and do whatever they wanted, that their moral conduct had no effect. Paul, on the other hand, was dealing with uh, quite the opposite. He was dealing with legalists, people who said, you know, that, that um, you have to follow all the rules. And so there were, you know, their arguments were against different problems. Any questions about James? Yes, Florette. Uh, I'm not sure if I thought this correct, but the Catholic Church Catholic Church is stating that Jesus had one brothers. Yes. Sisters. How can they 
that when uh, it's you know, in the New Testament? That is the question. <laughs> <laughs> they very clearly in several places it said the brothers it said talks about the brothers and, brothers and sisters of Jesus. At one point when Jesus was in Galilee, his mother and his brothers came to find him to bring him home because they thought he was making a mistake. Uh, the Catholic Church, you sort of have to understand the order of events. The Catholic Church decided at one point that Mary was so pure she could never have had carnal relations with a man. She had to remain ever virgin. Well, once they had decided that, then they had to say, well, Jesus could not have had brothers and sisters by Mary. So either they were children of, Je of Joseph from a former marriage, or more often, they interpret the word that we see as brothers as being cousins. You know, a blood relation, but not brothers. I think they, go th they jump through all those hoops to try to prove what they started out with as an assumed doctrine because of the elevation of reverence for the Virgin Mary. And that reverence for the Virgin Mary goes to the point of them, them arguing that, that Mary was born without sin, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where that comes from. And yet I do not believe there's any justification in Scripture for saying he didn't have any brothers, mostly because we don't believe that there, there's something inherently evil about the fact that Mary and Joseph or a normal married couple after Jesus was born. It said that Joseph did not know Mary, meaning did not have relations with her, um, prior to Jesus' birth. The very fact that it says Joseph did not know Mary prior to the birth of Jesus implies that after the birth of Jesus, their marriage was a normal relationship that involved physical intimacy. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons why you read that you go, I don't think, I don't see how the Catholic Church can defend that. They do. Now, and again, it goes back to the principle that they have, that the magisterium of the church, that is, the leaders of the Catholic Church, the things that, um, the opinions and the statements of the magisterium are equal in authority to Scripture. Which means that because the Catholic <laughs> Church says at some point God gave that knowledge about the nature of Mary to leaders in the Catholic Church, that holds just as much weight as what Scripture does. And so then they have to come up with all sorts of reasons for outs, you know, loopholes, to try to figure out how that can be true. But I don't think it's justified. Not, the Protestant Church has never thought it was justified. That was one of the things we disagreed with so much in the Reformation. Okay? Make sense? But we do believe this James, James the Just, head of the Jerusalem Council, was the half-brother of Jesus, and that Jude, or Judas, the writer of the book of Jude, a little short book, also was one of the half-brothers of Jesus. Because apparently, even though they, they were not on board with Jesus being the Messiah during his life, after he died and was resurrected, they decided, you know, I think there's something to this. Even though he was our half-brother, we grew up with him. Okay. All right, I've got about seven minutes till. Let's go ahead and take a break, and then we will come back and deal with some of the other books. All right, let's talk about now 1 Peter, the first of the Petrine letters, um, since that's the adjective for Peter. I had somebody come up to me last term who wasn't taking the class and said, why do you call it the Pauline Apostles? And I said, well, that's the adjective for written by Paul. You know, Roman bridges built by, Rome, by people from Rome were called Roman bridges. Okay, letters written by Paul were Pauline letters. That's, you know. um, okay, come right. First Peter, uh, we believe it was written around... Uh, 63 to 65 AD, sometime around the start of the persecution under Nero, which began 64 AD. Uh, the theme is encouragement and comfort from the Apostle Peter to those persecuted and suffering Christians. Uh, in this, Peter focuses on the heavenly inheritance that all Christians have received and encourages Christians, even in the midst of persecution, to live their lives in submission to God's will. Um, it contains a number of references to Jesus' life and teaching. There are a lot of similarities between the reason why we believe, although this has been questioned too, not as much as 2 Peter, but the, the um, authorship being by Peter has been questioned, but there are very marked similarities between 1 Peter, the themes, the messages in it, and some of Peter's speeches and acts. You can see the same themes being developed. You can also see similarities between 1 Peter and the Gospel of Mark. 
The Gospel of Mark, we believe, while Mark, John Mark, wrote it, he did so because he had been the assistant of Peter, and therefore the, the Gospel of Mark was written according to the things that Peter had told Mark. So some of the same things, the, 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 the same messages that are in 1 Peter, again, are both in the book of Acts and Peter's uh, sermons, and also in the Gospel of Mark. The epistle kind of mysteriously says that it was written from Babylon. We have no record of Peter actually going to the city of Babylon, and by the time this letter would have been written, Babylon was almost a ghost town. There was almost nothing going on there. Um, and so the, we believe that it may be instead a metaphorical reference to uh, the city of Rome, which is the source of, you know, the book of Revelation talks about the horror of Babylon, Babylon being a, a metaphor for the place of sin and of falseness and of, you know, the anti-Christian theme. Well, Rome was perceived that way during the early, because the, when the persecution started by the Romans, especially the Neronian persecution in the 60s, then that became sort of the Babylon, the center of sinfulness and anti and opposition to Christ. So we believe that this probably was written from Rome. It's also true that Paul, uh, Paul, that Peter mentions the presence of Mark with him at this point, and Mark was in Rome during the first imprisonment. We believe that Peter and Paul were both imprisoned in Rome, both then executed in Rome within a few years of each other. Peter first, and then afterwards Paul. Um, and the, the tradition is that Peter was crucified upside down because he was not a Roman citizen. His death was by crucifixion. The, the tradition is that he requested to be crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to, be, to die in the same way that his Lord Jesus had. Paul, on the other hand, was beheaded because Paul was a Roman citizen. And Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. In fact, didn't want to have anything to, you know, Roman citizens didn't want you to even talk about crucifixion. It was that horrible back then. Um, so, the book of 1 Peter, after his initial greeting, he talks about salvation for the believer and how that gives us hope for the future that allows us to sustain ourselves in the trials of the present and, and looks to the past in terms of how God has been, has been faithful in the past. He then talks about our sanctification, how we can be made holy, and in that holiness love one another and desire purity and spiritual sacrifice. Um, he then talks about submission. And he talks about submission not only to God, but also submission to the government, which is a strange thing to be writing to people who are being persecuted by the government. And yet he does. He also talks about submitting to others in terms of our business deals, in marriage, in all of life. And then part three, he talks about suffering. Um, how we are to act in suffering, how Jesus gave us an example through his own suffering, and how we can minister to others in the midst of our suffering as they suffer as well. So um, it's only five chapters, not a very long book. The, um, so in light of suffering, Paul does give us very practical instruction on how we're supposed to live, how we deal with that, how we deal with those who also are suffering, and even how we deal with those who are causing the suffering. So again, back to that kind of wisdom literature-like approach of a very practical understanding of how we're supposed to live our lives. Okay? Questions about 1 Peter? 2 Peter, which we believe was written around the same time or a little later, we say a little later because, again, the Neronian persecution happened around 64, 65, 66. 2 Peter, we believe, is, um, while Peter is writing it, 1 Peter was against external persecution. So 1 Peter is against the pressures on Christians from outside the church. 2 Peter comes back and deals with internal opposition, because of false teachers and what Peter calls uh, destructive heresies. Now again, as I told you, a lot of scholars have questioned whether or not Peter really wrote 2 Peter. Um, there is less external evidence, that is traditional testimonies, about 2 Peter being authored than any other New Testament book. We have less references to it by outside writers. I, I mentioned you know, the Polycarps and the Clements of Rome, Clements of Alexandria, the early patristic fathers, who often will affirm Authorship. There's very little said about 2 Peter in terms of affirming it in that. Um, and, again, liberal scholars say that because Peter is talking about false teachers here, much of the kind of false teaching he's talking about is Gnosticism. And so liberal scholars say that didn't happen until the 2nd century. 
But if you say that, you also have to discount Jude, you have to discount Paul's writings about what was clearly Gnosticism and others. So there seemed clear to me that there was some nascent Gnosticism earlier on, and that these books deal with that. Again, the reason 2 Peter had difficulty being accepted early on as canon is because there were so many other false writings that were attributed to Peter, it made people skeptical. It's just a very practical part of it. Uh, there, is, there is a section in 2 Peter and in Jude that they clearly are quoting each other, one way or the other. Either 2 Peter is quoting Jude or Jude is quoting 2 Peter. And depending upon which way you think that quoting is going, uh, will determine exactly the dating of the two of those. The indication is probably that 2 Peter was first, that's the traditional view, and then Jude, which came later in the first century, was quoting him. Okay? Um, when we say that there, you know, there's less, less external evidence for this being a writing by Peter than any other testimonial uh, authorship in the New Testament, still when we look at it, there are a lot of similarities between Jude and 2 Peter. There's also a lot of similarities um, between 1 and 2 Peter. In fact, there's more similarities between 1 and 2 Peter than either one of those books has to any of the rest of the New Testament. But 1 and 2 Peter do appear from the style, from the vocabulary, from the, you know, etc. Even though they deal with different themes, they appear to be uh, from common authorship. They appear to have the same author. And so, in spite of some internal and external concerns, there really is not sufficient evidence from any reasonable point of view, I don't think, to deny this as being legitimate canon and a product of the pen of uh, Peter, the Apostle. It was written just before the Apostle's death. We believe it originated from Rome, and therefore we believe that right after writing this, sometime probably around 67, was when Peter died. And so he would have been writing this from um, it's kind of it's his last statement, just like Second Timothy is Paul's last statement from prison before his execution. Um, Second Peter is this, is a comparable statement by Peter, and people say, well, you know, there's vocabulary differences, etc. Well, I, again, although the Holy Spirit inspired them to these writings, they were they were human, and so being human, the fact that you're in prison and under threat of death and in both cases, 2 Timothy for Paul and 2 Peter for Peter, um, they did end up being executed. And so we have to be aware that that probably changed the tone of how they would present it. That doesn't make it less viable. And there, as I say, there is certainly not sufficient support, internal or external concerns, to say that this was not written by Peter himself. Um, any questions about that? I do want, when we, whenever we talk about this stuff, I mentioned this to somebody uh, that we were talking earlier, I will tell you why I agree or don't agree with theories about this stuff. And I don't want to spend all the time dealing with academic questions about whether something was written by Peter or by Paul, etc. But I do want you to be aware that there are questions raised. Because, you know, if, you, if I teach these classes and you come out of here not being aware that scholars, you know, that Elaine Pagel says that you know, the writer of the book of Revelation was a second century Christian, was not John the Apostle or John the, you know, the Elder. Um, unless you're aware that those questions are raised, you're not going to have a clue the first time you come across that. You're going to go, what? So, I'll tell you why I don't agree. For the most part, I said, my, my standard statement is unless there is really compelling evidence, I don't think we should ever question either the traditional attributions of who wrote these books, and most especially, not if the books themselves, like the Pauline letters, identify the author internal to the document. Because if you say that, then you are discounting it as a, you know, you're saying it's a lie. And that's pretty serious. Right? It doesn't mean I'm not, you know, like when I talk about Hebrews. If I were a really hard dyke in the wool, you know, got to believe what everybody's always believed, I would tell you that Paul wrote it. I don't think Paul did write it. And I don't have any heartburn about that at all. Because there's every reason not to believe it. And it doesn't say, I'm Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to the Jews in diaspora this book of Hebrews. Okay. Or anything like that. All right. Let's talk about the epistles of John, which I really like. Um, 1 John, 
is, again, traditional belief is this is John, the apostle, the evangelist, who is also John of Patmos, who is John the Elder. I believe all of those were one person. I actually referred in, in a memorial service of all things, um, was not here, to, I don't even remember what my reference was, but anyway, I said something about, you know, as, as John the Apostle wrote in either the epistles or Revelation, and had somebody come up to me afterwards and said, surely you don't believe that that was the same John. I went, absolutely I do. And I said, why don't you think it was? And the person had no response to that, other than somebody had told him it wasn't the same person. So, I think it was. Um, first John is John's reminder of our fellowship with God and with each other made possible in and through Jesus Christ. John, like a lot of other of the epistles, Pauline epistles and general epistles, is showing concern for who he calls his children because of the threat of both worldliness and false teachers. That's a major theme. He is encouraging people to their fellowship with God and with each other in Jesus Christ against the threat of being drawn by worldliness and by false teachers. Okay? Now, he refers to them as his children. And you need to know this is consistent with um, John, as I told you, was by far the longest lived of all the apostles. He lived until he was uh, close to 100 years old. He lived in Ephesus. But he was seen as the elder. In fact, he refers to himself um, in, one, in two of the, the letters as the elder. Now, it's not just an elder. It's the elder with a capital E. Because in Asia Minor, what we know of as modern-day Turkey, John really was the elder. Timothy became the bishop of Ephesus. There were other ministers and pastors involved in ministry there. There were the seven churches of Asia Minor and other churches. But all of them saw John, the apostle, the evangelist, the elder, John of Patmos, same guy, as being the elder, the last of the apostles, the one who had been the beloved disciple of Jesus. And the, later in his life, when he no longer could walk very far, they actually would carry John in a, a sedan chair from one town to the next so that he could minister to and support the various churches. And he continued to be literally the elder. Uh, the, his traditional burial place today is in a church um, which would have, originally would have been the Basilica of St. John in Ephesus. And they have a squared off area with pillars. I can bring you pictures when we talk about this. That is the traditional burial place of John. And interestingly enough, it is just up the hill, you know, maybe 50 yards, well, less than not even that, 30 yards, a little higher elevation from what had been the Temple of Artemis which today is like one little squat pillar and one slightly taller pillar about like this, and that's all that's left of the Temple of Artemis, one of the most spectacular of the wonders of the ancient world. John's burial place is just above that. Okay? Um, we believe that this was written in Ephesus, that he wrote it after he wrote the Gospel of John. The date can't be fixed with certainty, but we believe it was probably 85 to 90 or 95. That's true with all of the epistles. Um, the Gospel of the uh, Revelation of John had been written prior, immediately prior to this, when John had been um, exiled to the island of Patmos, which is an island, uh, not a very substantial island, uh, and it was even less substantial when John was there, which is close to the coast of Turkey. Um, back in the old days, it's, it's sort of like today when a new politician comes into power, one of the, one of the obligations he feels is to discredit anything that his predecessor did. You know, oh, well, he screwed up the budget, and oh, he did lie. Yeah. Well, the same thing was true with Roman emperors. And so when the emperor Domitian took over as emperor of Rome, one of the first things he did was he discredited all the things his predecessor had said. And that meant that any prisoners who were, who were imprisoned for um, political reasons or religious reasons or something other than an actual literal crime, Domitian turned him loose. And so that's why John had been exiled to Patmos, because of his Christian testimony, his refusal to worship the emperor. But he was released at, uh, at Domitian, by Domitian, and so he was released, went back to Ephesus, and at that point wrote his gospel in the three epistles. Okay? Um, First John, like Jude, like Second Peter, has both a negative and a positive thrust. It refutes erroneous doctrine, 
but that it encourages the believers to walk in the knowledge and truth of Jesus Christ. So there's a cautionary negative, and then there's an encouragement to the positive in both of those things. Again, the book is anti-Gnostic, particularly this book, 1 John, talks about the fact that anyone who says that Jesus only appeared in the body and wasn't really incarnate um, is wrong. They are a false teacher. John strongly affirms that the Son of God himself became fully human, and in doing so, he is, he is confronting that nascent Gnosticism that existed back then. Another major theme in this book is the theme of love. The love is, is mentioned over 35 times in these five chapters. And so love is a major theme. That's the positive side. You know. The negative is against the false teachers. The positive is toward fellowship, first with God and with one another in love. Okay? And Jesus is presented as the illustration and perfect example of what love is and how love acts, especially in self-sacrifice, not just in talking about it. Any questions about 1 John? Yes? Wasn't John also boiled in oil at one point in time? The tradition is that John, before he was exiled to Patmos, they took him into the arena and, and dropped him in boiling oil, and it didn't hurt him. And then again, the story goes, everyone in the arena converted to Jesus because of that, because they saw that even boiling oil didn't hurt this guy. So they took him out of the boiling oil, didn't know what else to do to him, so they exiled him to Patmos. That's the, that's the story. I don't think many scholars would hold that very highly as a, you know, as, as a true story. There are legends associated with the apostles and others as well, but we don't know. Could have been. We don't know for sure. Okay? Let's talk now about 2nd and 3rd John. These two letters, again written after 1st, probably 85 to 90, um, are a little bit different. They're each one chapter. They're very brief. They're very personal letters. These are the only two letters, 2nd and 3rd John, that are not universal, are not Catholic in that regard. Um, the first one may be, or it may be to an isolated, when, when 2nd John is written to the elect lady, and this is a letter that he calls himself elder as well, the elder, uh, the elect lady and her children, usually that's understood to have been a church, that John is speaking metaphorically of a church as an elect lady and her children being members of the church. It could be that he's talking about an individual, or it could be that it's actually a reference to both of those things, that it is a woman who is part of a church and that it's, it's meant to be understood in two ways. Um, it, the concern of Second is of Second John is a letter of encouragement to the church. Um, again, there is a warning against divisiveness of false or self-serving teachers, but it is primarily an encouragement to those who are genuine believers. That's true in both of these letters. And then Third John encourages fellowship with Christian believers. Third John is a much more personal. It's the most personal of all of the the general epistles. It is written to a man named Gaius. And it is a letter of praise and of appreciation to Gaius. That's the first half of it. And the second half is the reverse with regard to a man named Diotrephes. Diotrephes apparently had taken over leadership of a church and then literally taken over. And he not only was a false leader, he, for instance, John, as the elder of the region, would send out teachers and whatnot. Diotrephes refused to accept them, to bring them in or care for them or listen to them. He isolated the church he was, he was head of from everybody else. And so John starts by blessing Gaius for his faithfulness and his generosity, and then he pretty strongly condemns Diotrephes for quite the opposite, for false teaching, for not being open to the gospel, um, and for his pride. Okay? Can I ask a question? Sure. How, would, would they have a process at that point in church history to... Um, Shut down. To deal with that? Yeah. Um, all, of, all of the churches at that time, their leadership would have been elected by the congregation, but then affirmed by the laying on of hands by church leadership. You remember in the Pauline epistles, we talked about the fact that Paul did that with uh, Titus on Crete. They would go around local churches, would elect their leadership <coughs> elders, and then that would be affirmed by the laying on of hands by Paul and Titus. Undoubtedly, the same thing would have been true. I mean, it doesn't say that, but this was the custom. The same thing would have been true in Asia Minor, that uh, Diotrephes would have been elected. Now, 
We don't know the specifics. He could have been elected and then took over and never did have an affirmation from John or from Timothy, who was the bishop of Ephesus, or from others. Or maybe they did affirm him and then he turned sour. We don't know. Uh, but there was a process. They didn't have an, a denominational kind of structure like we have now, where there was a moderator or whatever. They didn't have they didn't have one person that was in charge in any legal kind of way. But clearly, in this region, at the, by this point, the two people who would have the most um, authority by general acceptance would have been John, the elder, the apostle, and Timothy, who was the bishop of Ephesus. And so, in writing this letter, you know, John, to some extent, is addressing that. By identifying diatrophies as being prideful and negative and not consistent with the faith, that would have had pretty serious consequences probably for diatrophies in terms of everybody else's perception. Of it. So they could have just theoretically ignored that church from there on and, and let right. it fall apart or, right. or go its own way. Yeah, but they did not have back then, you know, it's not like a denomination that says, okay, we're, we're revoking your ordination. You no longer can serve in one of our churches. It wasn't structured in that kind of way. But there were people who were recognized as being in authority, like John and Timothy. Okay. All right. Um, and John, of course, and I believe that this is the John the Evangelist, John the Apostle, John of Patmos, John the Elder, that he was one of the pillars of the Jerusalem church. Um, it uniformly testified to in the early church that he left Jerusalem probably around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, and that he went to Asia Minor, that he lived in Ephesus, that he taught in that region. The tradition is that he took Jesus' mother Mary with him because when Jesus was on the cross, he gave um, John and Mary to each other to care for each other. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. In other words, he said, you're now family. Take care of each other. And so if you go to Ephesus today, you not only can see the, the ruins. It's ruins now. There's no Christian churches in any of these locations anymore. But the ruins of the Basilica of St. John and his burial site and you can go to the traditional house of Mary, where she, again, tradition says she lived. We don't know for a fact, but as I told you, my old pastor, Earl Palmer, whenever you hear a tradition like this, his response is, well, one wonders. We cannot completely dismiss tradition, nor do we have to completely be driven by a belief in tradition. So we're open. One wonders. All right? Let's talk about the book of Jude. Again, the book originally was written by a man named Judas, who identifies himself as the brother of James the Just, and so therefore he too would have been a half-brother of Jesus. And the reason you think, well, why didn't he say I'm a half-brother of Jesus? Um, that would have been considered a little too presumptuous. In other words, to say, I'm a brother of Jesus, you better listen to me, is what it would sound like. Instead, to, align, uh, to relate yourself to being the brother of James the head of the Jerusalem Council, the author of the Epistle of James, that would inherit in that is the idea that you're the brother of Jesus without coming out and saying that. Okay, you see that? You see that there, that, that would be a... There was always a concern in Hebrew writing that somebody not, um, not put too much on themselves, not take too much on themselves. This is the reason that John, in the Gospel of John, never names himself by name. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. But everybody knew who that meant. So identifying yourself in too presumptuous or too precocious a way was frowned on in Jewish writing. And so Jude, or Judas, it originally would have been. It was changed when it was translated into Greek um, to not align it, uh, make people think of Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, that, that Jude, by saying he was the brother of James, everybody would know without him having to say so that he was the brother of Jesus too. Okay? Um, we believe it was written during the second half of the century, probably after uh, Peter's letters, because Peter and Second, uh, second Peter and Jude do uh, say some things in common. Jude four four to nineteen and Second Peter two one to three three. The wording is very similar. The theme is exactly the same. So we believe that they borrowed from one another. Likely Peter wrote first and Jude borrowed from him. Okay. Um, the, the theme, more pointedly almost than any of the other general epistles, is against false teaching. That's the whole point of this letter. He starts out by stating his theme. He describes the false teachers. He tells people how to defend against false teachers. And then, again, one chapter, and then he has a brief doxology. A doxology is a statement of praise. It is a song of praise, literally. You know, when we sing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, 
A doxology is a short uh, song of praise or a statement of praise given to God. So everything about this epistle has to do with false teachers. And finally, not one of the general epistles, but I'm listing it in this class, is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is an encouraging prophecy about the final days, the second coming of Christ, the end of time, God's ultimate triumph over our evil, and the beginning of our eternity with him in heaven. Now again, there are parts of the book of Revelation that are epistolary in their form, like an epistle. But for the most part, the book is like much more like the book of, of uh, Daniel in terms of being a prophetic, prophetic statement of something to come with a huge amount of imagery. There are, as you probably know from Revelation, there are golden bowls and golden candlesticks. There's a lot of references to numbers. Um, seven is a very important number in terms of the, the and seven was considered a holy number in the ancient times. In the same way that Genesis is the book of beginnings, Revelation is a book of consummation. I don't want to say endings, but it's a book of everything being brought to completion. And so that's why Genesis and Revelation really bookend the entire of the Bible. The word revelation is actually a translation from a Greek word, apocalypsis, from which we get the word apocalypse. And it's often called either the Revelation of St. John or the Apocalypse of St. John. Apocalypse, for those of you who have been in classes before, this has often been a question on test. Apocalypse does not mean that everything gets destroyed. It does not mean everything blows up. It does not mean, you know, the, the end. And apocalypse or revelation is an unveiling of something that we had not previously known. Okay. Um, lots of emphasis on things like the Lamb um, in this book. We believe this was written around um, AD 96, the very end of... Um, Actually, I think that's wrong. I think I put that up there wrong. I believe this was written right before the epistles because it was when he was on Patmos. And I believe the epistles were written after he returned to Ephesus from Patmos. So I think this would be slightly before that, but only by a few years. Um, it starts out first with an introduction about the revelation Christ has given, the things you have seen and heard, the revelation that's been given, and then... Um, we have the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Um, some fascinating stuff in there. But two years ago, Carolyn and I, and the Hansons, uh, if, you, if you know Lynn and Dean, took a trip and we visited six of the seven churches of Asia Minor that are mentioned in the Revelation. We, we didn't visit Thyatira because there's nothing there to see. The others, there are at least ruins of some kind. You know, in the case, not very much ruins in some cases. Philadelphia is the place that has the most, in terms of the church from Philadelphia, has some fairly large, you know, like multi-story columns that still exist of brick and stone, although there's no church there anymore. There's almost no churches left in, uh, well, there are no ancient churches, I don't mean, left in Asia Minor since the Ottoman conquest. Right? Um, but I'll bring some pictures. And some of it, it's valuable to understand some of the details of that. For instance, in Laodicea, God said, you are lukewarm. You know, or actually, uh, uh, John in writing said that, quoting God, said, you are lukewarm. I wish you were either hot or cold, but the lukewarm I will spew out of my mouth. Well, Laodicea, nearby there, there are hot springs. In fact, there's this astonishing place. You maybe even see pictures of it. It looks like snow. There's these big sort of cascading white things. It's not snow. It's in a very warm part of the world. It's uh, minerals that have collected. That's from hot springs that have natural minerals that have colluded. They've just gathered over many, many years, and that's a resort area. Well, Laodicea is not far from there, and so they actually have, and you can still see part of it, they had clay pipes that would carry hot water from the thermal waters closer to Hierapolis, which is another town there, a couple kilometers to Laodicea. Well, by the time it got there, it wasn't really hot anymore. It was lukewarm. You were only lukewarm spiritually. I wish you were either hot or cold, but the lukewarm I'll spew out of my mouth. That begins to take on a different kind of understanding when you understand the Laodiceans were so proud of their hot water pipe, which only was lukewarm by the time it actually got there. Okay. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting sort of 
historical and ge even geographical stuff that kind of contributes to that. Um, we then get, after, after the introduction, the things that, you, that have been that you have seen in the Revelation of Christ, the things that are now talking to, about the problems that the churches have, and in some cases blessing them for their, their faithfulness, and then going on to the things that will take place after this. So what has been, what is now, and what will be. It's kind of the direction that Revelation goes. It deals with Jesus as the judge, the, the prophecy of tribulation that will happen, the seven seals of judgment, the seven trumpets of judgment, the seven bowls of judgment, then the prophecies about the second coming of the Lamb, um, and who is Christ, and then the prophecies about the millennium, which everybody gets all wound up about. You know, We'll talk about that when we get to it. Amillennial, postmillennial, premillennial, panmillennial, which is the other thing will pan out at the end of that. Um, Satan bound for a thousand years, the saints, saints reign for a thousand years, Satan is released and leads rebellion, he is then uh, cast into the lake of fire to be tormented forever, the great white throne of judgment, and then the description of the eternity, which we will spend in heaven, a new heaven and a new earth are created, Jerusalem descends as a bride for the bridegroom, the new Jerusalem, which is the church, and then is described, and then we conclude with an eternity with Jesus in heaven. Okay, that's the revelation. That's the consummation, the tying it all together, the completing that all of the rest of Scripture has been leading to. Any questions about that? Any of that? Any of those books? So you don't need to come for the next six weeks. Uh, Bob first, and then, uh, and then Suzanne. Can you respect that issue of the original language of these writings? You still on that Aramaic thing? Yeah. Um, Bob, Bob sent me a question recently. There is, um, there are, there is like four people who believe that, <laughs> <laughs> that the original writings were in Aramaic because there are Aramaic targums meaning there are Aramaic versions of the New Testament writings. Um, the belief, the, the standard belief of almost everybody, certainly all scholars, whether liberal or evangelical, is that the original writings were in Greek, and they very early on, because Aramaic was the, the, the street language, it was the common language of the day, they were translated in Aramaic for those who may not have been um, very, did not understand Greek as well, because they were more rural areas or whatever. Well, there is one church group today, which is the Assyrian Church of the East, uh, which, by the way, was and is a heresy. It's Nestorianism. It has to do with the multiple natures of Christ, uh, which was, it was uh, condemned by the church, 5th century or something, and yet they're still around. The Assyrian Church of the East insists that the original documents, which they have, were written in Aramaic, and then later translated into Greek. Well, they maintain that because that gives them kind of sole possession of the real documents. Nobody else believes that. Um, there's no evidence, as far as I'm concerned, to believe that it would be true. It makes more sense for the books, because the books were written for universal assumption, uh, consumption, that is the books of the New Testament, everybody spoke Greek almost, unless you were in a very rural area. It makes far more sense for the books to have been written in Greek, because more people could read them. Aramaic was limited to, Aramaic is a version of Chaldean, which was a Babylonian language, so it was limited to the Mesopotamian area. The Jews spoke it in the streets because they had learned it during the Babylonian exile, but not because anybody else spoke it. So the idea that they would have written the books in Aramaic, knowing that they were right, sending them to Rome and Ephesus and you know everywhere else that they were sent to that in the case of Paul's letters were, were intended for even the general epistles to the Jews in the dispersion meaning all those scattered out they would not have written them originally in Aramaic because there were most of those places they would not have understood Aramaic but they would have understood Greek so there really isn't any logic to it nor is there any real um, scholarly support for it yes one more and then, and then Suzanne you know there are significant differences between the so-called Aramaic translation of the New Testament and the Greek translation? I'm not aware of any. Um, the Aramaic Targums are actually considered support documents in studying the Bible, you know, because they are early. 
there's no question that they were early translations. And so they become, you know, they become one more source for our understanding of what the original documents might have been. Uh, it doesn't mean they're earlier than, they're just early. The earliest documents are from the third, that we currently have from the New Testament, are fragments from the third century. And then a lot from the fourth century, the Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and others. Um, so third and fourth century, but sometime around the fourth century or fifth century, I think it's fourth or fifth century, if I'm remembering correctly, um, the Aramaic targums were translated from that as well. Um, but I'm not aware of any theological difference. But again, there is a theological difference about the church that maintains that those were the original documents, that is the Assyrian Church of the East, which is a very small sect uh, of Eastern Orthodoxy, because they still maintain Nestorianism, that is, that, that having to do with the, multiple, the natures of Christ. They do not, they do not agree with the, the doctrine of hypostatic union, which all other Orthodox Christians do, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox. They are a sect that disagrees with the basic understanding of the nature of Jesus as being fully God and fully man, and how those two things fit together. And that Nestorian heresy, which exists in the Assyrian Church of the East today, has been around for 1,500 years. Or more. Okay, Suzanne. Just the sequence of uh, John's 1, 2, and 3 and Revelation. I think you said that he did Revelation when he was exiled and that was before the others. I believe so. Now, I could be, you know, I need to go back and look at that because I put that date up there, but then my, under, my, my understanding, and it's not because I just read it or anything, but my understanding was that the exile of Patmos occurred. When he was released from Patmos and went back to Ephesus, then the Gospel and the Epistles were written. But then one of the sources I was looking at apparently disagreed with that because it has Revelation as having a later date than the Epistles. So, um, but he... Elbow, Elbow has a, a date in here that I think was a little different. So. Okay. You do, I mean, that's why we always have a little C in front of those, circa, yeah. because there is some disagreement about it. They thought perhaps it was during Nero's reign that he was dying. Oh, well, that would have been in the sixth, yeah, way earlier. Um, I'll, I'll have to go back and look at that. I will. But again, we're not sure about it. But my my understanding is that Paul, exile of Patmos, has the vision, records the vision, which becomes our book of Revelation. Is then released under Domitian, goes back to um, Ephesus to take over again as the elder, and it's at that point. 80s to 90 that he writes the epistles and then somewhere in there he also writes the gospel and again he had access to the other gospels and that's why he's so different he didn't see a need to repeat that stuff so he gave us an explanation for why not what yes Did he do a lot of traveling or only what was more or less forced due to church need well um like did he start churches i guess is what i'm saying by the time he would have gone to Ephesus, which would have been 70 or later, we believe about the time that Jerusalem was destroyed, that was when John left and took Mary with him and went to Ephesus. Most of the churches in that area would have been planted already uh, because Paul had come there, he had planted churches, and that would have been in the 40s and 50s, in the late 40s and 50s. Paul would have been planting churches because that's you know when his activity was, and then Paul ended up, um, his death would have been middle 60s. So most of the churches probably would have been planted, would have grown, would have been established a decade before John would have gotten there. And so he comes in as the apostle and the elder and kind of take, provides leadership. Not doesn't take over, but they, people revere him. And, you know, he had been with Jesus. He was the beloved disciple. And so people really paid attention to him, and he took over as a spiritual leader and guide, um, he mentored people like Polycarp and others who had a first-hand experience with John. And that's why when we have Polycarp telling us John wrote the Gospel and the letters, the epistles, and the Revelation, and he was a close personal friend of his, who are we to say that's a lie? You know, Polycarp had some credibility since he died as a martyr rather than renounce the faith. Okay, he was not, he was not, a, not a lightweight, and we should not believe him. Uh, so, any other questions? Okay, you guys get a vacation for the next 13 minutes. I will see you either tomorrow if you're taking uh, Systematic Theology 2 at 1 o'clock or next week for our classes.